you all please take your seats? Good morning and welcome to this great First Friday event hosted by the Clarkdale Historical Society and Museum. My name is Gail Mabry. Oh, look. And I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today, Jim Gimmel, who happens to be my father, so it's a great special treat to get to introduce him. And my daughter. <laughs> um, Jim, my dad, moved here to Clarkdale in 1959 with his two sisters who are here in the audience, Shelley and Melanie, um, moved with his family and he's going to be talking today about his family's mining history in Jerome and some of the mining history in Jerome. Richard Gimmel, Dick Gimmel is his dad and that his dad and his dad's father uh, operated the big hole mine in Jerome. So I think that's pro, well, I should add, they moved to the house uh, in Clarkdale at 1419 First North Street in 1959 with their family. And the unique uh, little fact about that house is that his parents eventually sold it. But when my mom and dad got married, mom is here too, Dinah Gimmel, and moved back to town. They bought the same house that dad originally lived in and they've lived in that house since 1969. So that, that, it is the Gimmel house for sure. <laughs> So, Dad, take it away. Well, Gail told you everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dick Gimmel, my dad. Pappy Gimmel, my grandfather. <laughs> yeah. I'll yeah. get to that. Um, <clears throat> They leased the mine or rented it or something from Phelps Dodge in 1954. But I want to begin a little further back. I know there's one geologist in here. Uh, if they'll just be quiet while I talk because <laughs> I don't know anything about geology. Everything I know I read. Um, is there anybody here that was a miner? All right, cool. I can tell you anything I want then. <laughs> you, you, Dinah said I would cry. I'm going to go back a little bit in history, quite a bit back, back to uh, AD 650 to 1450. The uh, Native Americans here went up to Jerome and they found some green rocks and they liked to use that green <laughs> for <laughs> Donnie, you want to read this? No. <laughs> After that, um, Espejo came in uh, 1582 to 83. He didn't find any copper, silver, gold, or anything like that. So he went on. Um, Mark Gimmel, grandfather, maybe I should tell you who they all are. <laughs> Gordon Robin knows the first one on this side. He was lived in Mayer. He was an assayer, a geologist, a miner, and he was darn good at it. My dad's all dressed up there in the, the next one. <laughs> and that's one of their pickups that they started with. They had pickups, um, picks, shovels to begin. They didn't have a lot of money. I don't know how they got funded for even getting started, but they did somehow. And then next to Dick Gimmel with the guy with the brown hat, uh, next to Dick is Al Smith. He lived in Prescott also. And Mark Gimmel. Mark was born in 1886, about a year before the first claim was made in Jerome. So he didn't know about it. Um, he and his brother, David, well, Mark was born in New Zealand, actually. And he and his brother, David, uh, when they moved back to the States, were going around the mines in California, and they would just kind of high-grade the dumps where they dumped ore or 
some of the copper or gold or whatever they were getting. And they did that for quite a while. Pappy or Mark um, married my grandmother about 1913 and they moved to Crown King. He became a justice of the peace and he mined there with his brother David. And there was another Gimmel there named Randolph Gimmel. And I can't figure all that out yet. I, don't, I, I just found that out a couple of days ago. Um, Randolph helped or built the mill in Crown King. So the wildflower mine was way up in the hills above Crown King at a place called Tower Mountain or in a valley by Tower Mountain. And they had no way to get the ore down to the mill, down to the mill. So them and uh, Mr. Well, I wish I could think of his name. Um, anyway, they, they got together and they built a tram to go from the wildflower mine, which was a, several hundred or a thousand feet above Crown King, all the way down to the mill to operate the mill. And after they got operating and gotten uh, ore down there and got it worked on by that the mill, they would ship it by train to a, a, a smelter that I believe was in Stoddard, which is across the highway uh, north of Mayer. I'm not totally sure that's correct, but I'm hoping it is. <clears throat> okay, now maybe I can just read. You guys make it dark in here. <laughs> dark for old eyes. Okay, um, my mother's family had some, some uh, relatives in Crown King, eventually the Van Tilburg family. If you've ever been there, you might see their sign where their old ranch was. They had grown potatoes earlier, then moved down to Crown King, and they had two sons, uh, Don and Grant. And Don married my mother's sister sometime, I don't know, in the 20s probably. And I'm not sure that uh, Dick and my mother even knew each other at that time. But they got together later on and got married. And that's when we moved to Cartel. <laughs> Dick was born, did I say Dick was born in 1920? He was. Um, he didn't finish college. He went to go to college to be an engineer. Didn't finish because of World War II. He became a pilot in the, I think the Army Air Force, not a pilot, and a, a bombardier and the, uh, the guy that guides the plane around. What's Navigator, Navigator thank you. <laughs> um, when he was born, because there was no hospital in Crown King, Mammy, the grandmother, got on the train, went to Mayer, went to Inglewood, California. So he was born where I was born. That was a little later. <laughs> so now we've got these guys. This picture was probably taken in the early 50s, maybe even around 54, since they just have that old truck. Um, they mined from 54 to 74. Well, let's see if this thing works. You see the smelter in Jerome? Yep. Good. That smelter was clear up. If you've ever been up to Jerome and seen the open pit, it was way up high on the top of that pit when they took it down and moved the smelter down to Clarkdale, which you can see if you look over that way. Um, they did that because of fires, mineral fires inside the mine, in the tunnels and the shafts. Um, that all started pretty early in the 1900s and they had to just stop. They had to make it an open pit because the fires were just too bad. Speaking of the fires, this old trunk here held a breathing apparatus for rescuing people in the mine that were stopped because of the smoke or dangerous chemicals in the air. I have a picture of that device on, the, uh, on my slideshow here. 
I should have made this in bold print and big. <laughs> so a little bit about the early history of all the copper and silver and gold that was taken out of the mine. Approximately 33 million tons of ore. This is from the beginning, clear to the end, clear till 74. But 33 million tons of ore, averaging 4.8% copper, were, were mined at the United Verde from 1983, I'm sorry, 1883 to 1975, making it the largest volcanogenic, did I say that right? Oh, good. I had to ask the engineer, the geologist. A uh, massive sulfide producer in the United States, the largest sulfide producer in the United States. It's important to, con to contain an additional unmined resources of approximately 21 million tons. That's today. We're talking about that big pit. The pit was a big cone shape and that's where the ore body was, in that cone shape. When the mines were working, they took almost all of it out, except for this uh, 21 million tons, averaging 0.52% copper, 6.6% zinc. As impressive as that United Verde is, the smallest UVX mine <laughs> operation <coughs> was one of the richest copper mines in North America with, with ore grades of 10.21% copper and 20, sorry, in its 23 year history. That's while it was a, an op well, before they had to move the mine or the smelter down here. During the period of 54 to 74, the big hole mine, which is what I'm supposed to talk about today, and I'm gonna start here, I'm only 10 minutes late. 16 minutes late. Okay, oh good. Oh, what a daughter. Supremely her, talented. Her daughter's here too, That's right. Bailey. The rest of the family that I haven't introduced. And Matt, her and, husband. And my and husband, Scott. Dinah, did you get introduced? She did, yes. Okay. Yes, and Scott here. Is Scott's here too? Okay. My helpers. The Big Hole Mining Company extracted an additional 206,777 tons of ore. Um, they recovered 25.3 million pounds of copper, nearly 2,900 ounces of gold, and 200,000 ounces of silver. Jerome's transition to a tourist, oh, that's supposed to be off of there. <laughs> but about the time that, that the mine started, Jerome was talking about, what are we gonna do with our town since there's only about 200 people living here now? I mean, it went, went, it went way downhill. So they sold the Douglas Mansion or gave it or something to the state parks. Uh, my mother wanted to buy the Douglas Mansion, $25,000. Wish Did she had. <laughs> <laughs> um, I broke in there once when I was a teenager. I didn't break anything or steal anything Is that or why hurt anything. <laughs> Pardon? Is that why she wanted to buy it? No. <laughs> but I don't think Dick could see uh, all the reconstruction and remodeling that would have to be done as, as reasonable, so they didn't buy it. Okay. Dad, can I add in, for anyone that doesn't know where the Big Hole Mine is located, oh. if you've been to Jerome, there's a new, the new, say new, parking lot up above the fire station. The mine that's directly behind that parking lot is the Big Hole Mine. That level flat, flat part there is called the 300 level. The next level that a person could get into is the 500 level. Down in the bottom of the pit, there's an old, well, there was an old railroad track and a train would come out and take the miners out to the shower room down there at the 500 level. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay. Um, so they had to go up there and find ore. The simplest way was to look for some green rocks. In fact, that was the only way. They, uh, they would not they did not go tunneling into the mountain. They didn't make tunnels, that, that just wasn't feasible. 
<clears throat> so they would find ore, get the waste out of the way, dump it over the edge into the bottom of the pit, and then they would take the ore and dump it down to where pickups and loaders could pick it up and haul it down to Clarkdale, where it caught the train and went by the train that's down there now, all the way out to the other, other train, <laughs> headed toward Prescott or up to the, the train up at... Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Let's see what else I can do here. That's one of the loaders they bought. Got a couple of stories about those. <laughs> it was a little more of a bootstrap operation than probably Phelps Dodge's operation, I'm guessing. Oh, <laughs> way, way smaller. Uh, they had eight to 12 employees at a time. Uh, some of those employees were just were wonderful men from, from, from Jerome, um, Tony Lozano, George Verdugo, uh, I wish I could think of, oh, Balt. oh, Balt Lozano, um, Robert, Robert Sandoval, thank you, dear. The mind is going. Um, and I worked with a number of those guys, but Tony, George, uh, Baltazar and his brother Tony um, and Robert. I can't think of all the other names. It, by the way, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so this picture shows Dick at this big scoop. I don't think they ever had a crane where they could operate that thing. I don't remember it anyway. So I don't know why it's there. But he was down there looking for a piece of ore or something for uh, to show somebody. Let me pick up a couple of pieces of that ore. I'm guessing by the smile on his face that he found what he was looking for. He looks pretty happy. Yes, he does. He always looked happy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to be in the way. This is some of the rock they were looking for. I'm told that this rock right here is malachite, and my grandfather had it made from ore at the mine. Did I get malachite right? Oh, right, good. Some of it's really green, and some of it isn't so green. Can we pass that, or if I pass it, Dad, can I? Sure. What? I got, I got other plans for the truck. When I came in with this truck, I asked the guys, can I bring a truck of ore in here? They didn't seem to think that was a good idea. So they would blast uh, in the mine, first get the waste out of the way, and then get the ore, the load, and throw it over the edge down to the bottom, just like they did the waste stuff, except they put the waste stuff in a different place. Let's see here. Wrong guy, this one. Um, Robert Sandoval is quoted as saying that this was a very dangerous place to work, narrow roads, steep, and it was. And so they would, uh, when there was going to be blasting done, they would go into one of the old tunnels that they probably had cleaned ore out of and hide. Yes. Wait till you hear the rest of that story. Okay, so they drilled with a drill like this one. This is a picture of a modern one that I found online because I didn't have the old drill, of course. Uh, pneumatic drills, and they would use, they would start with a short drill bit, and then they would go to a longer one and drill the holes, oops, sorry. And before they would put the dynamite in, they would 
have to scoop out some of the drill material sometimes. And they used a little scoop like this, huh. which I use when I tape a hook on the end to put up my Christmas lights around the house. It's, <laughs> it's handy that way. And that this looks to me like it might have been homemade, and I would suppose if it was homemade that Gordon Robineau, one of the partners, made it. But I don't know. This is so instructive for me, that drill bit. I had no idea that was a drill bit. I remember those things laying around in our yard when yeah. I was growing up, and I had no idea that's what it was. Well, they weren't so. laying around. They were in my tool rack. Right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And they have a very, very strong, hard tip that would cut that rock. I bet they were wearing protection back then. Probably not. Yeah. His ear well, protection. that guy, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think they probably did. Because it would be kind of kind of hard to get in there with that drill going pretty darn noisy. I got that picture, I think, at the Jerome State Park. And this picture would be some of the bits they would use at various times with these uh, pneumatic drills that they were using. So here's one of the old trucks. Oops. Yeah. The old trucks um, that they would dump into. This is pretty early in the in the uh, 50s, I'm sure, 55 maybe, <clears throat> and that was a dump truck of some kind. They may have used that to go down to to Clarkdale to load the ore on a train. But before they did that, Robineau, who I said was an assayer, he would assay the ore, and if the ore was too high, like six, seven, eight percent they would weaken it with some waste because the smelter didn't like smelting that high grade of ore. Am I right? It's the chemicals in the volcanogenic and other kinds of ore that people would get from different mines changes the, the smelting process. And so they didn't like it and they would deduct a little bit of money from what the ore was if they sent too high of a percentage. Gordon had an assay office right there in the, in the mine. They did have some big rocks. That was at the Jerome State Park. I mean, that thing was huge. And occasionally, um, I guess uh, maybe not too often, they'd dump the load of rocks in the truck and take it down and dump it into the ore car. One time, Jack Cox, the guy that lived in Mayer, taking a truck down there, dumped it, and the big, one of the big rocks, or several big rocks, got caught on the tailgate, and as the truck tipped up, it just kept going. <laughs> yeah. It was quite a process to get that out of there <laughs> and, and get the truck back in use. That's the kind of a truck about the size that, that uh, uh, Jack used. Now those, those trucks were kind of noisy going through town. And uh, some, somebody had a bakery. I don't know exactly where it is, uh, somewhere in the main street in the main block of uptown. Jerome. Yes, in Jerome, I'm sorry. And uh, they had this bakery and the lady that owned the bakery complained because as a truck would go down a hill, it'd make their cakes fall. <laughs> uh, so I think they did something about that. I don't know if they got Jack to go slower or what, but they did, uh, did do that. But what did she say? Uh, that's later, that's another place. <laughs> Thank you for your help, dear. Okay, I'll tell you that story too. There's a cafe up there in the main block. I think it was near the post office at that time, and Dick had meals in there occasionally, and that lady that owned that, she was up there and, you know, when you're mining, you're going to do a lot of exploding of stuff, and it was very noisy. Uh, it was even worse when, uh, when the big company had it. So she complained. She said, I'll never understand why they built that mine so close to the town. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think that's me, but it's similar to something that I had to do once in a while. They'd drop the, drop the waste down, I'd pick it up with a loader, 
take it over the edge and dump it over. Well, the loader had two brake pedals. One was just a brake, and one was a kind of a clutch and a brake. Well, when I was dumping over one time, I hit the wrong brake pedal, and it kind of kept rolling. <laughs> it looks like a big drop-off, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, the bottom of the pit's 500 feet, and we were up at 300 feet, so it would have been bad. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> no, neither I'm, would I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I backed up a little bit, dumped the loader down right there, so I had a block so that the tire, if I got there again, the tires at least wouldn't roll off into the mine. Jim, how old were you when you were doing all this? Oh, that's a good question. High school? No, uh, I was uh, uh, in my 20s, early 20s. Uh, this was, six, well, it was when we lived in Prescott, 65, 66, yeah. yeah. I was teaching then, with Dinah was teaching also, and uh, I had to work in the summer because teaching didn't, well, we, our first contract was $4,800 in Prescott, and that, that was not very much. Um, so I got to work at the mine. Okay. Now, I wasn't the only one that had trouble with a loader. Jack Cox had one. Oh. Hello. Oh. Try it again. There you go. There. For some reason, he was driving the loader down into the pit from the 300 level to somewhere, and I don't know why, but the brakes went out, it turned over, he jumped away, and they had to get it out. That was another um, interesting task. They got it turned right side up, and then pulled it out with a bulldozer. And that took some more repairs to, uh, I mean, some repairs to get that working again. Probably like, kind of like his truck that went in the, Thing. Okay. Oh, oh, yes, he was. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. It, it was a, a malfunction of a loader. And I have it right here, dear. It was the 60s. Okay. Well, there's that railroad in the bottom of the pit. I couldn't get there to take a, a modern picture, get it in color or anything, because it's all blocked off, and I didn't know who to talk to. There was a guy named Duke Connell that worked up there for many years as kind of a, a watchman over the, Jerome prop or the Phelps Dodge properties. And he had control of everything, of who could go up there and who could see things. So we needed a new shower room because the old shower room burned in 67 when there was, a, there was this big snow and uh, so it burned up. From 67 on, they didn't have a shower room for several years, and finally the, some of the miners got a little upset about it. I'm sure they had a bathroom somewhere, but I don't know where that was. Um, but they, they got upset about it and talked to the uh, um, guy in charge of mines in Arizona, and they complained, and so they had to build a shower room. And we had to go down there. That's where the old shower room, there was probably 50, 50 showers in there. All the guys would come in, they'd undress, hang their clothes up, clear up at the top of the ceiling, almost as high as this one, and then shower, clean up, and go home. And we, would, we went down there and got permission to take out a couple of shower stalls, install them in our new, quotes new, it doesn't look that new, does it? Oh, the new shower room. It was a new shower room and assay office. That's where Gordon did his assaying. Um, and you can still see that building up there. All right. This is the breathing apparatus that was in that trunk. 
when, when they bought it, I guess. It wasn't in there when I got the trunk. The uh, Duke Canal gave us permission to take anything we needed. And, well, I didn't need that, but I wanted it, so I took it. <laughs> and that, that was a good deal for us. Okay. They mined there for a number of years until the late or the early 70s, and they decided they could make more money if they had a leach plant. You would run water over the leach fields, or over, over the old uh, um, waste dumps. The water would turn to acid, and it would pick up any copper that was in those waste dumps, and then you'd bring it down. Well, they started with a couple of airplane um, rubber fuel tanks. The rubber was about that thick. And they did that up on top of the 300 level, which is what you can see now today. Um, and they started doing this with just some junk steel they got somewhere. I don't know where they got it or what it was exactly, but they tried it out and it was working. They thought that was a good deal. So Gordon and my dad, they all decided, we're gonna go down below the Hopewell Tunnel and they built some cement tanks. Those cement tanks, they would put in shredded car bodies that Giles, the guy that drove the big truck down to Douglas um, when they got the, the uh, leach plant going, um, would pick it up one, two, three, maybe four times a month and take this big truck down to Douglas and then on the way back he'd pick up shredded car bodies from some place in Phoenix. That's my grand... <laughs> Grandmother, right? No, Gloria, Aunt Gloria. Yeah, um, my dad's sister-in-law was a painter and she painted this. I couldn't find a color picture, so I, I bought that. I brought, what, brought that one with me. Okay. That one actually hung in the Clarkdale Town Hall for about 20 years. Yeah. Until I retired and took it with me since it was mine. You can go on to your speaking and then we'll, cut, yeah. we'll catch it up. Well, I kind of wanted you to see what size truck Jack had, or Giles had. Um, it had a trailer about 40 or 50 feet long, semi truck, and he would load that. As I said he'd load that thing up several times a month, take it down to Douglas, and it had, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars worth of copper in it. The copper was 85 to 95 percent copper at that point from the leach plant. Um, Gordon had fashioned some valves to hold the water in these tanks. And then he could open them from the top. The copper would come out and collect in the bottom of a uh, hole. Let me, one, of the, one of the last pictures I have anyway. It was actually before this breathing apparatus. You can just keep going on and we'll. Okay. I don't think I have many more pictures. I had trouble finding pictures. By the way, I apologize for the black and white ones. They're pretty, pretty weak. Okay. So the leach plant. And I'm almost done. Well, it was, it was very much toward the end of their operation in 74. And a couple of things stopped them from mining up there completely. One was that it was just getting too hard to get to the ore. Um, they were, you saw the mine picture, it's all the way around that circle where they were working and uh, they just had trouble getting it out. I think also the EPA had something to do with them stopping um, because they were running this acid over cars and then it would run out the tank and then run down into puddles below the leach plant. And uh, I'm not sure they wanted to deal with that. <laughs> Is there anyone from the EPA in the audience? Uh, let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. Well. Well, I wish I could show you more pictures, but I think that's all I have. Um, good. The big coal mining company corporation, did you lease all this land from Phelps Yeah, the process was, was a, a, a business deal with Phelps Dodge. They leased it. And they probably had to pay a, pre, a, a little percentage of the ore they sent down there to get processed. But I don't know. Oh, but it was a corporation. The big hole mining company? Yes. Yeah. How big a claim is that? 
That well, was about as big as that big old hole up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. Um, pardon? It was big. It was, it was big. And they, they worked an awful lot right above, well, that was the old train station up there. And they worked above that and a little bit to the right, if you go up there and look at it. Any other questions? I, mm. Oh. Um, Oh, oh yeah, I will do that, that's right. Um, Robino, he was quite a character. He built a swimming pool at his house because uh, he'd like to swim. And he built it this deep. <laughs> so that if he, if he lost, you know, something, he would, he would at least be able to breathe. <laughs> he, uh, he was interviewed by somebody that had a little booklet um, I don't have any of that size. I found this picture in Jerome after I had uh, uh, gone up there to look for anything in Jerome that might be helpful. And that was Robino. I think I put a picture up here in, in front of there before. When he was being interviewed, um, yes, I know. He's, he's, I want to get this whole, he and two partners, they were actually three partners, have leased a big whole mine from the company. They were cleaning out the tail, tail ends of the ore potty. The company couldn't work a profit. The, big, the Phelps Dodge couldn't work a profit. And Robineau said, hell yes. He said, I've worked the big company mines Senator, Swastika, Iron King, Bluebell, you name it, he'd work there, but only when he was broke. <laughs> then the guy said, you know, how is this lease? He said, his eyes shone. Sweet, damn sweet. Never be another like it. <laughs> <laughs> Never be another like it, yeah. Um, while they were working at the leach plant, Tony Lozano was down there with a few guys that were working there and they stopped for lunch. And Tony always had a real spicy Mexican dish for lunch. In fact, so spicy, he, his wife would put in a terry cloth towel in his lunchbox because he could wipe his forehead with it. <laughs> well, there was a squirrel that kept coming around and it came right up to them and they would give, him, give the squirrel food, part of their sandwich or whatever. Well, one day, Tony gave him a piece of this chili, and the squirrel took it and ran off. He came back about five minutes later and just bit the hell out of Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, oh, I got to read to you a little bit about Crown King. When, uh, Mark and his brother, da his brother David were working up there on the uh, wildflower mine. And it says here, the wildflower mine was located in a deep gulch on the north side of, the saddle, of, saddle be of a saddle between Tover Tower Mountain, gee, I wish I could see, and Del Pasco Mine. The Gimmels, Gimmel brothers, Mark and Dave, operated the wildflower mine from 1910 to 1916. And it says, um, the wildflower, so, I'm sorry, there was no mill at the, at the wildflower, so they built a tram to go down with a Mr. Harrington, he had a lot of money up there in Crown King, I think, and an aerial tram that ran from the mine to the mill in Crown King. After finishing their work on the wildflower, they reworked the tailings of the Crown King mill. The Gimmels later operated the big pit in, at Jerome on a small scale for about 15 years and got rich. <laughs> I don't think they got as rich as this lady thinks they did. And Dad, that that you're reading from is a history book that's Crown, available for sale up in Crown King, I believe. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, you probably can't see this, but it's a picture of that valley that they brought the tram down. 
they say you can still find evidence of that tram up there. I haven't gotten up there myself, but I'm going to someday. It's on my bucket list. I have a question. Okay. Do you know if anyone mined at the Big Hole Mine after your family mined there? Oh, that's good. Not exactly at the Big Hole Mine, but over on the, below the Little Daisy Hotel, well, it's a residence now, uh, there's a couple of shafts there. The smaller shaft, somehow Paul Hanverger, a friend of mine, found out there was some gold down there. And somehow he introduced a company called the Budge Company. They came in, they opened up that shaft, and we went down there together once all the way down, about a thousand feet, kind of dark. <clears throat> but anyway, we were, we were looking around, and the Budge Company operated, I think, for two years. They spent a million dollars, and they made a million. <laughs> <laughs> so they came out even, and they quit. Mm -hmm. And after, after the uh, big hole was closed, no, nobody has operated that mine since that I know of. Working as a miner? I don't think they were working as a miner. Oh. I don't know what they were doing, but Caretaking the property, the probably. Guys there you know, I, I think I got in trouble with those two guys once. <laughs> I, I had a friend up here, a relative or somebody, and they wanted to go down and see where the Hopewell Tunnel and the leach plant was. And I took a bolt out of the gate and opened it up, drove down there. Uh -huh. No, they, they didn't have bolt cutters, but I had a wrench. Anyway, went. Went down that road. By the way, that road, I resurfaced once. It was the old railroad that came out and went down, came out and cleared to Clarkdale. And I took a loader down there and they told me to clean it up so they could get down there and do their work for the leach plant. Um, anyway, I took their friend down there. We drove around. We didn't hurt anything. We came back out and I bolted the gate back closed. And these two guys drove up and they were a little ticked at me. Even though I told them who I was, but that didn't matter to them happen sometimes. <laughs> so a little more family history about Dick Gimmel, my dad's father that was here at the mine. He, did he retire after the mine closed? Yeah. And eventually moved here to Clarkdale. The Clarkdale Lodge that's up across from the park that the Conlin family owns now was an apartment complex at that time. After his wife, my dad's mother, passed away, he moved into that apartment complex, and that's where he died in 1992. And then as a family, we took his ashes up on the hill above the big hole mine and scattered his ashes above that, that mine, so. Yep. Jim, you were talking about the big uh, what, tank that the airplane tank? Yes, the yes. When we were kids, he brought one of those down to the house, and. <laughs> I don't know what kind of crud we got on our body. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that. The, the. Oh yeah, frogs too. Oh. Oh okay. And he also would bring the inner tubes from the payloader. Mm-hmm. And we used those as a trampoline. I gave myself a concussion once. Oh. So that's what happened to you. Yes. <laughs> I, there was a question back here, yes. What made you transition to teaching and where did you teach? Well, um, out, of, out of high school, we, I went to NAU, and Dinah went to ASU, and uh, then she transferred up to, to uh, NAU when her father died. We did both go to ASU for a while and got our, our, our bachelor's degree there. And uh, I, I kind of hoped when I went to college that I could become an engineer, but I didn't have the brains to do it. <laughs> so I went into education, that well, was easier for me. And uh, we started teaching in, Pre uh, Dinah taught in Tempe for a little while. And then uh, we moved to Prescott for two years. And then a friend of hers that she went to kindergarten with was moving to California, and she asked us, why don't you guys come with us? We applied for a job in a little town called Milpitas, which stands for Little Corn Patch, near San Jose, and moved up there for, we were there for three years. 
and then and then Darren was born our son and uh, in California yeah in California and we decided to move back home where family was and I taught fourth grade through eighth grade and Dinah taught mainly first grade one year third grade yeah dad taught his whole well after California he started here in Clarkdale so he taught at the Clarkdale school until he retired and then went back. They talked him into coming back to be a part-time administrator after he retired from teaching. And mom taught in the Cottonwood Oak Creek School District and then retired. They're still living in that Gimmel house on 1419 First North. We call it a kit because these old Clarkdale houses tend to fall apart. <laughs> so we're always working on them, you know, something has to be fixed. I see people are leaving and I'm, I'm sure they're bored. If you're bored, <laughs> Or if you have more questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Talk about, tell them about the box. Oh, okay, yeah, that's good. This was my dad's hat. It has a carbide lamp on the front. You add calcium carbide, some water, and it produces um, acetylene. Right, thank you. Um, I don't think they really had to use these very much because they didn't go into tunnels very much. Just if there was a glob of ore there, they got it out. And so Dick wore this hat a lot. I think his head must have been smaller than mine. <laughs> he, uh, he decided to upgrade one time and got one of those aluminum hard hats and he was going down the tunnel in the mine or the, uh, the bottom of the pit with Duke Connell his, his friend up there and the, and the supervisor of the Phelps Dodge. And they got down the road a ways and there was a big rock in the way. So they decided to roll that rock out of the way. <clears throat> as he bent over, his hat fell off just as that rock started to roll. His new hat became kind of flat. <laughs> oh, they did have, besides that little truck of jacks, they did have a big truck, a big dump truck, kind of like this one. <laughs> it's my grandson's now. Great grandson's Great. now. <laughs> well, he plays with it. He's got one at home, too. <laughs> Tell about the signal. Oh, oh, when I was dumping over the edge that time and I almost rolled into the pit, uh, somehow Jack, got, I mean Giles, got my attention up above. He was up about 50 or 60 feet above me, and they were drilling when I started. And he came over the edge and he got my attention and he did this. You know what that means? Everything's okay? I said, yeah, sure. Well, he came down a few minutes later and he said, do you know what that means? I said, well, no. It means we're gonna blast. <laughs> <laughs> and that box down? So, yeah. Okay. And so we, uh, we backed the, the loader out of the way tipped the bucket over and got under it while they blasted. Okay, this is a dynamite box from the mine. It says Atlas Powder Company. I tried very hard to find a place to buy dynamite or um, even TNT. I couldn't find it online, I don't know. They're using something new now? Oh, really? Oh. Uh -huh. I'll be darned. Yeah. I think there are some places in other, on other continents where you can buy some of it. And I think the cement plant uses some stuff now that doesn't make as much noise as it used to. But it still blows up and loosens the ground for them. But I don't know what that is. Okay, what else, dear? Oh, oh yeah. I'll get it done. It's pretty heavy, Gail. Oh, I'm pretty strong. You talk you are, and I'll hold it. Don't, don't grab a uh, Yep, I got it. Places. Okay. Um, my sister Shelly had this in Flagstaff and brought it down. It didn't have anything to do with, the, with the, uh, um, the big hole. It was before that, and they had signals that they would have, I guess they had electricity down there in the mine, and they would blast certain ways and tell people, get out of the way or get out of here or there's a fire or whatever. And so I brought this sign. Mm -hmm. Give it back to Shelly when she goes back to Flagstaff. All right. 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would happen to me if I didn't have hair. Yeah. I don't believe they used one of these very often, but the mining company, you know, if you had to cut timbers to shore up the, the roof, they would do that. But Dick, Dick had a McCulloch chainsaw um, that my son has now. I don't know if he ever uses it. <clears throat> you know, McCulloch built a, a factory on Lake Havasu or in Havasu to build chainsaws and stuff like that. What am I, oh, this lamp is not a carbide lamp. It ran on, on some other kind of oil, some kind of fuel oil, and you'd light it. And uh, this one's a little different. I just happened to have it. And the hook on the top, you'd hang that? Well, you'd, a... you'd hang it on your tractor or okay. railroad car or something like that. Speaking of railroad cars, I want to tell you, if you want to go underground to a mine that's really neat, go to the Queen Anne mine in Bisbee. They have a great tour. You get to ride in a, in a mining car and they give you a helmet and uh, they'll take care of you. It's really fun. And so I recommend that and I recommend the Jerome uh, Historical Society, uh, not, I'm sorry, the Jerome State Park Museum. It's nice. It's even nicer than when I broke into it. <laughs> Carl? Well, it varied. Um, one of the articles I read from six to 12 miners, I believe. It depended on the year. You know, um, I guess some of them, when it snowed a lot in Jerome, I don't know how they could get to work. So some of them didn't make all that much money, but they were good people, good men. The old railroad station was used as our garages. They'd put the loader in there, put the dozer in there, and. Uh, work on them if they needed to work. Well, I think it was because of uh, Mark Gimmel. He was a miner not just in Jerome here, but all over Yavapai County. If you, if you could find the name of a mine, he probably worked at it at one time. And then somehow he knew about Jerome and just they decided. And, probably, and Gordon, I'm sure they were friends. And uh, Gordon would have uh, helped that make that decision too. So they just went out there and looked at the area and said this would be a good place mine. I can't answer that guy. I didn't, I didn't know those people in 1954. <laughs> their partner, though, was an assayer, right? Gordon? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so my guess would be they knew the value, that there was still great value in that mine and it was well, and worth like, the risk. And like Gordon said, he. Uh, he worked a lot of mines around here. And those, the, ones, the ones I named are where he worked, plus more. Um, so it, I, don't, I can't really answer that. Do you think they have enough regulatory stuff for safety? Or they just, the one that they created, they just have to use it? They, they did have some regulations, like the shower room. They had to have a shower room, and uh, they kind of put one foot in front of the other slowly to get that done. Um. An interesting um, Clarkdale tie to the safety issues at the it, it was dangerous work, obviously. And the Clarkdale the Valley View Cemetery, the town of Clarkdale, operates that. And it opened in about 1913. And we have all of the records. The town has all of the records of that cemetery back to that time. And in, back in the day, they would write down what the cause of death was. And if you look in those records back from when the mine was operating, you'll have a whole page of 10, 12 names of people who died in a mining explosion in Jerome. Many instances of that, of folks buried in that cemetery for mining accidents. Jerome had one of those big shovels at one time, this is way before the 50s, uh, way back, that would dig, just claw it off. I mean, it was a huge shovel. It was like the one they used in the Panama Canal, or it may have been one of the ones they used in the Panama Canal, a Marion shovel. And it hit an unexploded set one time and blew up, and it just destroyed that thing. And one of the big pieces of steel that, oh, it has to be as big as this table that was 
part of the claw work wound up clear down in the gully. Uh, just before you make that sharp turn to go in Jerome, mm -hmm. it was down there, the gulch. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, it was clear down there uh, from being blown up from that. No wonder that lady complained about the blasts and flattening the cake. <laughs> Yeah, and they built that much. That piece, by the way, is up in the Jerome State Park also. Mm -hmm. They've got it on display. Well, it is 11 o'clock, and I think that that is the, the witching hour for the presentation. So if there are no more questions. The I Historical Society will be serving lunch, and, and oh, no, they won't, will it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe you learned something. <laughs>